Good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Barton, CEO for the Silver Sun Technology Cluster. Welcome to our um, newest, uh, latest special interest group events. Um, this one is uh, for wearable technologies looking ahead. Um, so the SDC, um, as, as part of our thought leadership strand, as you can see behind me, um, have put together special interest groups to bring people together around different areas of technologies, encourage them to collaborate, um, and really making sure that we bring together like-minded people um, to um, network, learn about the latest technologies and, and the issues that are pertinent uh, for that particular area. Um, and that's very much what we're, what we're looking to do here today. So with wearable technologies, we always try to give you an overview of um, some new and interesting tech that's out there, um, but also to give you um, insights into sort of privacy and data management um, and intellectual property, which we'll be doing today. Um, so it should be a really, really good session and, uh, and really informative. So uh, very much looking, looking forward to this one. Um, before we, we hand over to the speakers and, and get going with it, uh, with it um, I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple of um, sort of housekeeping things. So uh, we're on the Airmeet platform here. So there is the opportunity for people to uh, react with the presentations, what's going on. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little smiley face. Uh, so if you like what you hear, you could put like a little thumbs up or smiley faces or whatever, whatever it is. So do feel free to, to use that. Um, but there's also the ability to, to ask questions, obviously. So if you look at the top right hand corner, um, you should have uh, a chat functionality there, but also uh, a question and answer functionality there. So do please um, use all of that um, to ask any questions, um, because after the end of every presentation, we have the ability to, to ask um, questions to the to the speaker. So uh, please put your questions in there um, so that we can raise them. Or if you if you prefer, you can also there should be at the bottom of your screen, I believe there should also be a functionality to um, to raise your hand. Um, and if you do that, we'll we'll invite you onto the stage the stage, and you can actually ask your question in person. So if that's what you prefer, then then please feel free to do so um, during the Q Q and A sessions um, after all the presentations. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the networking so far. There will be another networking session um, sort of a little bit later on. Um, you know, as obviously the point is to bring people together, um, you know, do please make it, make use of all of that. Um, so I think that's about it in terms of housekeeping and things. So I'd like to invite our first speaker now, which is uh, Dion Mars. Let's see if I can find Dion. Um, and Leon is with uh, Body Track. I'm just inviting Leon to the stage. Um, and he's going to talk about some very interesting technologies that they've developed. Um, so hopefully we'll see Leon arrive. There he is. Excellent. Um, so Leon, over to you. Thanks, Pim. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Yep. All good. Good. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here this morning to speak to everyone a little bit about what we do here at BodyTrack. Uh, I'll try not to make it a, a sort of sales pitch, but um, more more for your interest, hopefully. And uh, at the end of it, would welcome your your questions. Um, but I'll let uh, Pim and the team sort of manage that uh, to save uh, any any mishaps on my end. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen now. Just give that a few seconds to load. Hopefully it's loading at your end. Okay, well, um, I'll assume that's loaded. If, if, if it's not, if someone could let me know, that'd be great. So yeah, um, just to repeat again, so I'm Leo Marsh. I'm the CEO founder of BodyTrack. Um, BodyTrack was founded solely to look at uh, how we can better enable health monitoring in hazardous environments and challenging situations to essentially improve safety uh, reduce risk and in some cases also improve performance. So that's really what we do. It's our it's our specialism. Um, just a little bit about the the company is from a background point of view. We're London based uh, in the UK here. Uh, we've been around for about eight years now. We consider ourselves experts in uh, particularly data analytics and the sensor hardware that provides the inputs to, to, to the analytics. Um, we do all the engineering uh, in-house of our solutions and we have manufacturing partners who uh, make the, 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 the solutions as well. Uh, we have various customers from multinational industrial uh, corporates to um, defense organizations, to emergency services. 
um, so quite a wide variety. Um, our technology is, is validated against medical controls uh, regularly, I would say, both by us, but also by third parties, including uh, academia and, uh, and customers, which is obviously a really important part of the, of the validation process for our, for our customer base. We do have international patent families for the solution, which is obviously important for us in um, you know, establishing our, ourselves in the marketplace. Um, we are predominantly investment backed so far. We're an early stage company and um, our, our major shareholder is uh, Reply SPA, uh, Milan quoted um, software services uh, consultancy business. Uh, with a turnover around about but 1 billion euros, um, very supportive uh, investor. And we have uh, quite a few other uh, investors as well, but Reply SBA is, is the predominant one. As well as our own internal team, which um, I'll show you in a moment, we do have a full supply chain as well. And that sort of covers the key, uh, the key disciplines and uh, with experience in producing technology to, to the relevant sector standards that, uh, that we require. So just a quick snapshot of the sort of team and extended team at, at, at BodyTrack. So, um, you know, just just from a high level, really, I think a lot about what we do is, uh, as I say, on the one hand, in the sensor uh, hardware side, so embedded sensor technology. Um, and then really after that, it's all about the software and how we uh, use data analytics um, to to pull the value from from that data. And then that's you know really what the what the customer is seeing at the end. So. Um, I'd say at least half of our team is software driven and the other half uh, sort of hardware, software, uh, sorry, hardware um, predominantly. And on the right hand side, our supply chain covering um, different sort of specialisms, including geolocation on the one hand, maybe regulatory um, and then um, you know, into, in, in, into manufacturing, both sort of low, low level prototype level, but also then into volume manufacturing as well. Okay, so uh, we're now going to sort of frame the the key aspects around body track and starting, of course, with the problem first. So the sort of four key areas that we we help our customers with is in the area of uh, heat stress is is the first one. And heat stress you could consider a few different examples. So uh, you could imagine on the one hand a firefighter in a, a blazing fire. Um, they would have a lot of radiative heat coming towards them. They wear protective clothing, so their internal heat loss is is prohibited. Uh, to a degree, and they're also very active. So they're also generating a lot of heat through through work. And uh, those three compounding factors lead to, you know, quite often to heat stress. Similar sort of environment in say production facilities, particularly if you think about metal smelters or other um, production environments where a lot of heat is being given off, then um, that that's, that's highly relevant as well. Um, Noise induced hearing loss, NIHL is uh, another big problem. It's, it can be a dormant uh, problem that doesn't raise its head until later in life when um, uh, someone's overexposed themselves to, to, to loud noises. Um, that's something we also like to have impact on. Uh, fall detection is you know, pretty commonly monitored in, in our industries, but it's not always that reliable and it can lead to quite a lot of false positives which uh, of course is never great because then um, people start to stop relying on it and um, ignore the signs, which is, uh, I'd say, a user experience challenge. And then finally, the fourth one being fatigue. And we, we were sort of classify fatigue in, in three different ways. The first one being uh, drowsiness or the sort of voluntary need to fall asleep, which is particularly relevant for people doing uh, you might say mundane tasks or uh, driving vehicles would be a, a classic one there. Um, but then also looking at other types of fatigue, so mental fatigue and physical fatigue and, and uh, mental fatigue being where you're sort of concentrating um, intensely for a prolonged period of time. And then physical fatigue, of course, where you're carrying out physical activity for a prolonged period of time can lead to, um, you know, decision making being uh, affected and, and and that then is a potential precursor for, for injury. Um, but in addition to injury, there's also potentially productivity losses and other other related operational uh, impacts there as well. I'm not going to focus on the numbers too much, but I think the key point here is that it is a, a, a very large um, uh, problem individually across the four, but also in aggregate as well. So in terms of the market for this kind of, um, I guess, health and safety wearable um, solutions like body track then i think the industrial market is arguably the largest 
opportunity. Um, it's it's a somewhat a, a direct uh, to market approach. Um, military and fire are also highly relevant again due to the challenges, the environmental challenges that the the workers have there. And um, you know, in, in in sort of market size in aggregate, looking at about 150 billion dollars. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people here we're talking about sort of nearly 70 million. Uh, potential users, um, so, so so pretty large, and of course this is growing uh, year on year. Um, we have calculated some uh, ROI, of course, for the customer side. Um, we can provide ROI, or technologies like BodyTrack can provide ROIs up to ten times if they're if the customer is utilizing each of those four um, value propositions. Then then obviously the the, the, the ROI um, multiplies. But when we talk about the ROI, we're really talking about the key cost savings. And the key cost savings come from things like um, preventing the incident happening. Uh, uh, so you don't have the medical costs, you don't have litigation costs, you don't have legal and admin costs, you don't have loss of productivity, retraining, um, and, and and the like. And um, you know that those can be extremely large. Uh, and, and you know to calculate that, you look at obviously the number of incidents across the the sector, the average cost of an incident, and then of course you have the the number um, per 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 person, and then if you take into account the cost of adopting a technology like Body Track, then you can get a net saving, which is what we're what we're showing here. So a little bit more about Body Track specifically. So uh, our solution is a full um, end-to-end solution in a sense, but we can absolutely partner with different companies at different stages in, in that, but we are able to offer it to, to the customer directly. Um, so we have the sensors on the on the person, um, they send, uh, they, they collect and send data in real time to our cloud platform um, where we do a lot of processing. And then we send that data to a um, an interface, so a dashboard interface, which I'll show you uh, how that looks in a moment. But we can also do things like send text messages or other, other types of alerts that might be useful for the customer, just depending on what sort of response setup they may have. Um, this is all very much a real-time process, um, and uh, we do you know, a, a lot on the person as well as in, in the cloud. So we utilize the full full infrastructure here. So a little bit more detail on, on, on that and how we then determine the markers. So um, when it comes to heat stress, uh, there's the sort of key key area, then we're looking at a reference of core temperature. Um, and uh, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail a bit later, um, but that, that that's really the key input there. But we also use uh, the heart rate uh, inputs and understand the total physiological risk as a result of that. For fatigue, we're predominantly user using heart rate variability, um, but we're using other, other markers as well. But that's the main one, and we're understanding there the time intervals between the beats, which tells us a lot of information about how uh, stressed uh, or unstressed the, the, the body is. And then we use our own uh, indexing to, to be able to establish which type of fatigue um, the, the person is exhibiting. Um, and of course, that can be used for understanding operational aspects such as uh, shift pattern optimization and, 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 and the like. For noise metering, of course, you have to use uh, microphones. Um, so we're using uh, audio technology there, and uh, we're looking to, of course, prevent the hearing damage occurring in the first place. So this is very much around the real-time alert capability. And if we think about the slightly uh, longer-term uh, value add here, then we're thinking, you know, this is more about trying to prevent um, the incidents happening in in the first place. So. Um, through reporting, uh, through looking at policy, through looking at regulation, then we're hoping that technologies like Body Track will help to to generally reduce incidents, and, and um, that's of course the primary focus here. Uh, of course, any solution to be adopted by a third party has to be um, uh, has to make economical sense. So, um, you know, there are of course the cost reductions as well through the injury prevention, as I presented um, on the previous slide, but then also looking at the operational. Um, benefits and the benefits due to uh, reduced risk profile, of course, which then links through to the insurance uh, angle, which is a really interesting play, um, and you know, uh, to, to regulatory bodies as well as a side side sheet of that. And the majority of customers for this kind of technology are, are generally public uh, listed companies, and for them, the environmental, social, and corporate governance 
uh, metrics for their business are, are, are very important and um, th these wearable technologies will, will definitely have impact there. So in terms of the real-time dashboard, the body track dashboard, this is essentially um, uh, how it looks. Um, you can ignore the names, they're, they're just there for, for presentation purposes. Um, but essentially what we have is um, the, the key vital signs or the key parameters um, in, in, in each tile. Each tile represents a person. And when the parameter um, reaches a threshold, uh, an amber or a red, uh, depending on how the customer's configured that, then it'll, it'll send off alert and, and the alert will show quite clearly and the tile will present itself at the top of the display. So it's very easy to see and take action on. Uh, it will flash um, and uh, there'll be an audible warning if that's enabled. Um, and um, uh, actually the wearer themselves also would get an audible warning through the uh, earpiece. This is an earpiece based um, sensor solution. Um, and um, the, the wearer gets that notification regardless of whether there's connectivity to the cloud. So that's all processed on board. So it's like a backup uh, alert system should there be any challenges with, with, with connectivity. But assuming that the connectivity is enabled, then this is what the supervisor or incident commander would see. And upon an alert being raised, then we then utilize a geolocation um, feature to uh, understand where the person may be, whether they be indoors or outdoors. We can cover both, both scenarios there um, and look at a, a map view of, of multiple uh, workers, or we could even look at geofencing if the customer wants to um, control where people are uh, moving around site or at least understand what, their, what, the, what the movements of individuals are to help them understand um, safety around site and, 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 and so on. An important aspect is, um, of course, data security and uh, data protection. Um, all of our customers obviously very, very uh, interested in that and we take that very seriously. Uh, it's important to say that we encrypt data at all stages of the process. So at rest um, on the device, uh, in transit to the cloud, and then of course um, in, in, in the cloud itself. So that's a, a full system encryption. And then in terms of data protection, of course, we're GDPR compliant, uh, HIPAA in uh, the, the Americas. And, you know, when it comes to privacy, you know, sort of anonymization and access to data is very much controllable through the platform um, and configurable by the, the end customer with different uh, levels of permission for different types of users. So, um, you know, it's really, really as, as flexible as the, as the customer would need. Um, and I think technologies like body track can be used in, in, in different ways. You know, the real time uh, alerting doesn't have to be used. If that's a, for some reason, a concern for the customer, then uh, you could consider it as a background um, data collection solution to help understand risk around the workplace. You may want to compare one site to another. If it's a large multinational company, maybe um, even geographies to see how different sites are comparing to one another, um, which would help to inform different safety measures, different levels of protective clothing, um, and so on and so forth. But of course, to unlock the full value, then you really want to use the real-time uh, alerting to, to be able to prevent the incident in the, in the first place. So it does have that full, full ability there. Um, in terms of the, the specific hardware that, that we've designed, um, we have designed this to be fully deployed uh, without the use of any other hardware. But as I say, it can be also coupled with things like digital radios and, and other um, wireless communication devices. Um, the solution is designed to last for full shift. Uh, that's obviously a, an important requirement in these occupational scenarios. And um, you, could, you could say that it's a, uh, essentially a, a smartphone uh, in terms of its capabilities for anything you would expect a smartphone to do apart from to run lots of apps, which of course is not the intention here. In fact, most of our customers prohibit the use of smartphones in the workplace due to distraction. So we absolutely don't want a, a large screen and, and lots of apps. We just want the, um, the core functionality of the data communications um, and uh, the, the onboard processing and the, and, and the battery um, uh, power as well. Uh, the main sensor piece is in the earpiece. Um, and uh, I'll show you the, the sort of detail on that in, in, in a moment. And just to say as well, you know, this is a ruggedized solution. It's designed for the environments it's going into. 
Um, we're just in the process now of securing CEFCC uh, compliance and, and UK uh, CA as well. And then we'll be looking at intrinsic safety clearance for the slightly more hazardous environments like oil and gas, uh, underground mining and, and utilities. So when it comes to the earpiece, the key sensing capabilities are in the area of um, the temperature sensing. Um, that's using you know, equivalent technology to what you would find in a typical medical ear thermometer. We're then using um, a heart rate module at the bottom of the earpiece, which is uh, equivalent to a pulse oximeter that you would find again in a, in, in a medical environment. And then we're using motion sensing uh, for the motion aspects, um, uh, probably fairly obvious there. And then moving on to the audio, and audio is obviously an important part because uh, well, two things really. One is that a lot of our users would would already have some form of audio input, um, but also we have to think about the hearing, as I mentioned earlier. So um, we have to, on the one hand, enable hearing where it's safe to do so, and then provide protection against that um, where there are harmful harmful noises. So we actually offer both types of earbud. They're different different styles. Um, so one enables full transparency of sound, so you can hear everything around you just like you would if you weren't wearing an earpiece. And that's really important where, you know, you're relying on your hearing for your situational awareness. But then we provide typical uh, foam uh, earplugs that are compatible with, with body track to provide that level of hearing protection that, um, that the users need. There's the audio prompts, and this is the feature for the wearer to get the uh, sort of backup warning um, that, that they may be able to take action themselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a scenario where they have, there's a, a red flag. Um, and then finally, the noise dissymmetry, which is um, you know, external facing microphone to, to be able to measure the, the incoming noise. And you know, maybe an important thing to say about the earpiece, um, and just so you can get an idea about scale, I'm showing you an, an example here. I uh, hope you can see that. Um, it's it's very small, so the um, you can see the central portion is extremely small. Uh, it's designed to sit um, flush with the ear, so you can wear ear defenders over the top, and um, the device will work perfectly well. And when it comes to the noise metering, then you can actually understand what what noise level is coming through the ear defenders. So quite a useful feature. Um, when it comes to the motion aspects, we're actually using two nodes. So we're using both the earpiece and the communication module. And we're sort of taking different feeds from, from, from both of those, and in some cases comparing to, to help reduce those false positives. But as a result, we've got a lot of data, a lot of information, and there's a lot we can tell. So we can think about um, when it comes to position. So if you have an impact and you, and you fall, what's your resultant position? Um, we can think about vibration uh, and vibration load, which is very relevant with, for example, being in vehicles um, or controlling machinery uh, in some cases. Um, and then we can think about other types of body position that, that may be relevant to understand what someone may be doing, um, what, what situation they, they may be in. So it's a very um, uh, flexible uh, system. So just to walk through the key USPs of the of body track. Uh, technology specifically. I mean, I think um, the key, key one really when it comes to heat stress monitoring is to be able to measure under the surface of the skin. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, if you think about skin temperature, it's uh, highly dependent on the ambient conditions. And if I go back to the firefighter scenario, you think about uh, how much heat is coming into the body, how much is trapped under the protective clothing, the skin will actually be quite a lot hotter than the, the core temperature Whereas if you're um, an oil worker working in an offshore oil rig with you know, uh, onshore cold winds, then you're going to be pretty cold. Of course, you'll be wearing protective clothing, but nonetheless, your skin is likely, very likely to be cooler than your, your core temperature. And, and, and the, the variation there and the different parameters just make it very difficult to determine uh, heat stress reliably from, from skin temperature. So we have the advantage of looking down the ear canal, of understanding what's what's um, uh, beneath the skin and a more direct measure. Um, accuracy is obviously really important. If you're gonna do any data analytics, the, the, the data in is gonna dictate um, the reliability of your output. And you know, as I say, we've consistently measured this against medical um, uh, controls 
to be to be very accurate. Uh, patents, uh, of course, talked I guess a lot by uh, hardware oriented companies, um, and you know they, they they are important for for, for obvious reasons. Um, I think at the beginning when I put out the sort of four different problem areas, um, clearly uh, having four sort of value propositions in 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 one solution um, helps to drive down cost and complexity for for the customer um, and and you know not just that but also for the wearer themselves then there's much less burden to to have multiple devices you know single device that they can they can use for multiple benefits um, platforms you know cloud connected platforms are uh, extremely valuable um, i think when it comes to the real time aspect and, and reporting um, really it's the it's the, the only way to to achieve that successfully of course a solution that's going into rugged uh, sorry hazardous environments has to be fit for purpose you know you if you put in a, a standard consumer product it's not going to last very long um you know you're talking about very um uh, messy environments in some cases you've got metal filings uh, dirt oil um on the one hand but then things are going to get dropped they're going to get knocked um and you know they're going to go through a lot of temperature cycling as well and and they have to be ruggedized for that environment um, with our communication module we can then provide the end-to-end -end data communications we don't rely on third-party solutions there which is a uh, you know, big benefit for for reducing complexity of supply but as i also mentioned we do have the ability to to, to partner with solutions where uh, where it could make sense where they already exist in a, in a certain uh, market and then lastly, uh, on the hearing protection side, uh, you know, key, key benefit here and the ability for us to provide um, uh, the, the, the protection of the noise, noise metering piece. So I'm just gonna finish by giving you some example applications of um, this kind of wearable technology and um, you know, just to help sort of spark some, spark some thoughts. So um, first one is, uh, first few are in, in industrial sector, but this one is mining. You can imagine both um, open cast uh, mining, but also underground mining, uh, very challenging environments, extremely hot, um, and of course, very dirty and, and uh, where the ruggedization is super important. Steel production, um, you know, you're dealing with molten metal, it's extremely hot, um, very, very challenging uh, heat stress environment. Paper and pulp also, um, but here we have also a lot of humidity. Of course, you're essentially turning wet pulp into uh, dry, very thin paper at the end of it. And to do that, you have to evaporate a lot of water um, and run uh, the mill at, at, at a very high temperature uh, to, to produce that. So it's particularly uh, challenging for engineers when they have to go in and do uh, maintenance, whether that be uh, urgent maintenance or even routine maintenance, the machines are still still very hot and take a long time to cool down. Um, thinking more a little bit more now about fatigue, then that comes very relevant for logistics, um, but also warehousing staff. So particularly if you think about um, uh, people that may be in a lone working environment, so they turn up at a facility working a night shift, there aren't many people around, then, um, you know, there's exposure there. If someone was to fall, um, you know, they, they really need to have some sort of alert to make sure that their safety is 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 monitored. And then into the sort of more um, military orientated use cases. So fast jet pilots, you think about um, all the stresses and strains on their bodies, um, uh, various various challenges there, and and um, you know super super interesting area. Even dismounted and even mounted soldiers as well, mounted being in in vehicles, um, have a lot of heat stress challenges, fatigue challenges, particularly also physical fatigue. Of course, um, physical fatigue is one of the key. Uh, uh, inputs to injury, uh, musculoskeletal injury, which is a major issue for any military organization. So, you know, physical fatigue monitoring is also important there, as well as, of course, heat stress uh, dur during training. And then um, lastly, but by no means least, and very relevant probably for some of the audience today would be in, in motorsport and thinking about, again, you know, um, uh, the sort of person behind, behind the vehicle. Um, the vehicle is often very well monitored, but the um, the human is is not always that well monitored, and that's just because of availability of technology. And of course, what um, what we're hoping to enable is that trying to get that balance a bit more uh, even, where the, the, then the the driver here or the pilot or whoever it may be uh, can can be monitored to the same level of 
um, uh, detail and 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 and, and uh, protect protect the health and safety there. So um, I think that's uh, sort of my time up there. So thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, this contact details just on this slide, and and uh, at this point, I welcome any questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, look out for some messages. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you're very, very interesting. Um, so, so please, uh, people, do do either raise your hand to ask a question in person or put them obviously in the, in the Q and A functionality. Um, while you do that, I'll uh, I'll kick off with some some questions. Um, one thing that I wanted to 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 pick up upon, and it's 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 probably a bit of a nerd question, um, but when you mentioned the 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 sort of the geo fencing, because um, at, at a previous event we had. Um, a presentation on sensor technology within construction, especially highway construction, where um, basically both vehicles and people were fitted with sensors to make sure that it wouldn't come in too close proximity and you don't run people over and, and all that sort of stuff. And presumably with, with the geofencing that you mentioned as well, it would be a relatively simple um, solution to fit vehicles or hazardous objects or anything like that with some sort of sensor as well. And, and again, have that same, actually you're getting too close, please step back. Give give the wearer an alert. Presumably, that's possible. Uh, it certainly should be. Uh, thanks, Pim, for the question. I, uh, we're actually uh, engaging with a couple of companies at the moment who have technologies like that, so proximity detection technologies, and and working out how we can partner for that you know, exact use case. So, um, yeah, I think the, you know, the geolocation feature that that we provide through a partner of ours. Um, uh, enables us to track through the, the, the conventional routes of, um, you know, if it's outdoor, then it's GPS, GNSS, and the other satellites, and indoors, it's triangulation through Bluetooth beacons or, or Wi-Fi routers. Um, and that, that's how we would do, do, do that. But yes, if you then use on the ground um, uh, sort of uh, technologies as well, lo local um, RFID and other, whatever it may be, then um, yeah, you can imagine then a full, um, F f fully sort of in interactive proximity and, and uh, geolocation uh, feature. Yeah, uh, very, very interesting. Um, I suppose the, the, the other thing, um, and it, it kind of, I mean, again, at a previous event, we, we had a presentation from um, somebody um, sort of monitoring sort of uh, vital signs within motorsport as well and things, and, and, and obviously you can do something incredibly similar. Um, but one of the things that came up there was the, I mean, obviously the, the the security, but also the the comfort levels of the of the wearer in terms of you know kind of having somebody else having access to the data. Um, you know, so for instance, if you're a racing driver and you're about to start and you have a freak out or whatever, you you kind of want to know that that information is not going to go out in into you know the wider world and and things like that. So so there must be data concerns around this sort of stuff and. And, and what would you need to put in place to make sure that if, if you are going to ask your personnel to, to wear these sort of things, presumably you need to do that with a whole level of comfort on, you know, making sure that they're happy with that and safeguarding and all that sort of stuff. Is, could you comment a little bit on that area and, and how, how you guys approach that? Yeah, no, it's a great question and um, something we get asked a lot, actually. And obviously it's really sensitive. It's really important um, for the end users to be you know bought into the value of the solution because ultimately you know this is a, a, about the end user it's about improving their safety it's about improving uh, uh reducing risk and, and improving the, the 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 working practice um so um maybe a couple of things on that so i think the the first thing is that the body track system primarily is designed as an alerting based system so we're not you know this isn't about collecting every single data point that the sensors generate we, we do that so we can then use our analytics suite to be able to find the the, the the key insights that we need to say okay well this person is nearing um, a red fatigue level uh, we need to put out an amber alert to say look here's the heads up um, you don't necessarily need to do anything depending on how they want to to react to that but then it's a red alert okay now somebody needs to take action regardless of what the situation is um, if 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 there's no action taken then there's a a high chance that this is going to end badly for the individual so you know even the individual at that point i'm sure would would um appreciate the system being in place to to protect them um so i think you know the, the sort of alerting piece is, is is really important to communicate um and when when that is communicated people generally understand that the, the, the value and and they understand that it's there to help them not to 
um, try and assess their performance or if they've been out two nights in a row, um, are they then going to, to lose their job because they're, uh, we can see they've had a hangover. That's not, that's not what this is about. Um, so, so, so just to say that, and then also, you know, when we start to engage with customers, we tend to find and totally understandable, but the management team are often quite, um, cautious and, and, uh, I uh, think, well, you know, I think we're going to probably have to make this fully anonymized and um, otherwise we don't think we'll get buy-in from from the users. And, you know, you can understand why why they may may think that. And then when you talk to the users, um, and we've had this before, and there's been sort of 70, 80% of the users have been actually quite happy to share their data, um, let, let alone have their name associated with, with the alerts. So um, yeah, we tend to find actually that the, the, the users are very receptive to, to what we're doing and, and um, that may be to an, an extent a generational thing, of course, people being more used to wearing things like, you know, uh, wristbands and so on that track activity levels, um, maybe through sport or just walking around, um, so on and so forth. So I think very important, very important that um, the conversation is had, but there are ways to, to, to get around that. Yeah, it, it kind of leads me on to to another thing, and um, it might be a little bit of an unfair question, um, but that won't stop me asking it. Um, <laughs> to what extent would would you, as as uh, as an employer, to what extent are you able to 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 force or make it mandatory for for your personnel to to wear these sort of things? And and because presumably they have a right to refuse if they're very uncomfortable with it. And and how does that go? Is is that an area that you've looked into at all, or is that kind of in the not your problem box? Or um, I mean, it would be our problem in the sense that you know our customers are important to us. Um, uh, we want to to find a way for them to be able to adopt it successfully. So um, I think it depends a bit on you know the type of company, uh, whether it's a private company, a public company, whether there's trade unions involved, because um, the trade unions are obviously a, a you know, big, big part of certain certain decision making as well. Um, but I think, you know, open communication around this is is, is, is really important. Um, uh, in terms of forcing people, well, maybe um, military organizations can do that. Uh, uh, you know, I think if even if private companies that, that, that don't have any particular concerns about um, uh, a bit of leverage, then they may start to lose staff. So, uh, you know, but uh, generally speaking, I would say, you know, everyone has to obviously observe uh, the the data protection laws and act in an appropriate way. And of course, the the user really is the data owner. Um, the customer generally is the uh, data controller. They 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 sort of govern how it's controlled and. Um, you know, companies like BodyTrack are the processor of the data. That's generally how, how how it's considered. So the end user ultimately has the decision on whether their data is uh, deleted or if they want to enroll uh, in, in that. And you know, there may be a sort of fine line between um, sort of legal teams at, at at the customer end and, and and the users. But yeah, that is down then to the to the customer to to finalise. But I think over and above that, I think really this is about um, uh, more of a sort of culture of safety um i think that that's really the important bit to focus on and then the rest of it sort of follows really as a more as a administrative um, exercise yeah and then really making sure that people understand the benefits and, and why course, you're yeah. doing it and how things are being handled and the security of it and, and all that sort of stuff because yeah yeah i mean ultimately if it, if it can help prevent accidents and it can help save your life then you know you're probably more inclined to engage with it then you know we're going to steal all your data which will probably make you a lot less inclined to, to go with exactly. it, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah. So it's 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 really sort of how you how you practice that, which is uh, which is really really interesting. Um, I don't think that we've had any any questions come through, um, and I don't know if anybody you know wants to raise their hand or, or do anything. Now, as as per usual with STC events, I mean, obviously we'll share Leon's details um, with people afterwards, and we'll send the slides as well. So there's plenty of opportunity to follow up afterwards. Uh, but I'm always very very keen that while we have the expert in the room. To, to make use of that and ask any questions. So um, I'll, I'll fire in one more question and then, um, you know, people can can um, obviously, you know, post their questions uh, as, as well. Um, I mean, in terms of your sort of where you are in your journey, because obviously you mentioned you have some some sort of private um, in, investment as well. How far away would you, would you feel you are from, because presumably you are now sort of approaching all these various markets that you that you talked about. 
Um, so are you now in the stage where you, you're sort of building up your, your customer base or are you still in, in sort of development? Where are you on, on the journey? Are you, are you rolling out? Are you about to roll out? Is that still a little bit away? Where, where are you in the overall scheme of things, do you feel? Yeah, so we're, we're just at the point now of where we've been in the field for um, uh, a few years with different levels of prototypes from sort of MB, MVPs to um, you know, testing, testing various things out. Obviously, COVID has, has come along and caused us a slight um, a challenge in, in the, the fact of customer budgets uh, drying up uh, and, and, and having to sort of uh, lock down themselves. Um, but that's sort of starting to free up now. So we're, we've been very much um, focusing on uh, building in you know, uh, or taking on board at least the, the customer feedback over the last couple of years and over the last sort of nine months been pushing hard to um, finalize the specification for the solution because with any new technology um, you know you have to test things before you can really finalize something which which the the, the market uh, knows they want um, and then yeah it's the push to production and we're just in that phase now so we, we're, we're a couple of months away from from production uh, for certified product um, but we're already now starting to to, to look at uh, orders from customers um, which are largely based on having carried out trials already and now that sort of starting to convert into into procurement contracts. Excellent, excellent. Uh, really so, good. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. So it's an exciting time and you know, certainly uh, with, with, with hopefully COVID um, situation improving, then I think the second half of this year will be a really good one, hopefully for, for body track. Yeah, fantastic. No, well, uh, well done. Excellent. Um, I, I don't think there's there's any any other questions, so I think we'll uh, we'll leave it here. But fascinating session. Thank you very much for um, for sharing the story with us. Um, and as I said, you know, there'll be plenty of opportunity um, for other people to to follow up as well. So hopefully that will happen. But um, but thank you very much, Liam, for um, for, for joining. Um, thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. We'll, we'll see you at a at a future event. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker now, um, and I particularly like the fact that um, Leon mentioned that obviously patenting um, the technology is is, uh, is is a must and and is very obvious. Um, and um, just on that, I would like to invite uh, John Kenser to the to the stage to to talk about that um, specifically. Um, we can't actually see you at the moment, John. You are, is your camera up or right? Oh, wait. Oh, no, there we are. <laughs> very good. Um, because uh, you know, I'm sure you're going to cover it in your in your presentation. Um, but is it really that um, that obvious? Um, and it, it certainly is a good thing to do, as I'm sure you'll uh, you'll emphasize. But um, I'll uh, I'll won't preempt your your chat, um, and I'll I'll just um, well let you sort out your camera, and then I'll. <laughs> <laughs> <That's Hello>. <laughs> now, <laughs> over to you, John. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. You can hear me. Okay, can you, Pim? Yeah, yeah, all good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Leon. That was a that was a really interesting uh, presentation, um, and it's really good to see that you uh, understand the value of patents and indeed have have patented your products. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give a presentation today on a little bit on just IP generally, patents, trademarks, everything else, and then going into how. Um, how there may be specific issues in the in the wearables field. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Hmm. Um, can you actually see a presentation on there? Um, it should be shared. Yes, we can see that fine, John. All good. Looks, looks right. You can see, oh, okay, I, I can see, yep, okay. Um, yeah, I, I've entitled this IP Expanding Your Horizons, which is a bit of a bit of a broad term, but generally, as I said, it's just a, a presentation on, on how to make the most of IP. Um, Excuse me one second. So first of all, a brief introduction of what exactly is intellectual property or IP. Um, IP is basically property of, of the mind, if you like, as opposed to tangible physical property. Um, 
So IP involves patents, in patents for inventions, trademarks, registered designs, uh, copyright, um, unregistered design, right, which is actually kind of three-dimensional copyright, if you like. Uh, other common law rights, like um, passing off rights, uh, which are enshrined under, not under British law, under sort of uh, British um, case law, if you like. And there's other rights like trade secrets, plant breeders rights, and so on. Um, a patent. Uh, a patent can be obtained for any invention, which is, first of all, new. It's, um, as I'm sure you will know, it's very important that you mustn't have disclosed an invention uh, to anyone other than under confidence before you apply for a patent. Uh, it mustn't be not ob mustn't be obvious, which basically means that someone who is skilled in that particular field but has no creative um, instinct at all. It, the invention wouldn't be apparent to them. In addition, the invention must be one which is capable of industrial application, which essentially means that it's it's a product that can be made, a method that can be used industrially, um, and it mustn't. There's a certain there's a, a few types of things which just cannot be patented, such as rules for playing a game, um, discoveries, scientific principles, um, and so on. So a patent protects a general concept, as it were, um, and a good patent, um, usually one that's drafted well by a, by a patent attorney like myself, is actually sort of contrary to, to a lot of sort of opinion. A good patent can be very difficult to design around. A good patent isn't restricted to a specific version or, or embodiment as we do the overall principle behind it um, and can, when used correctly, can really be a very powerful tool. Um, turning now to, to wearables, what type of, of features in the wearable technology can be patented? Well, basically it's the same as any, in any other field. You can patent the hardware, the actual sort of devices that, that are that are worn, um, all the devices in the in the in the chain as it were, um, and all the sensors and other devices, batches, power supplies, everything else in the device. Uh, you can patent the software, um, obviously the software in the, in the device itself. You can patent the, the functionality, what it's actually doing, if it's doing something clever and technical in a way that hasn't been done before. If the actual functionality that it's doing is new, you may be able to patent that. Uh, you can patent the, the infrastructure itself, uh, the whole sort of system and, and the platform itself, the whole system um, that the wearable device is used in. So the way that data is maybe stored in, in the cloud or servers or whatever is distributed, is communicated between uh, various various devices in the chain. Um, you can also patent uh, security systems, uh, encryption techniques, all these kind of things that will be used in the, the overall system from the, the specific wearable device to the sort of overall platform itself, all of them may, may be patentable. So it's worth considering all of these features. And indeed apps themselves, if you, if you are using an app, uh, I'll go on to apps later. Often apps can't, usually apps can't be patented, but sometimes there may be features in an app that can be patented. Um, to go on to, uh, here's, here's a typical, it, it's a drawing from a particular patent, a figure from a particular patent, just showing the kind of things that you have, the, the basic concept of the wearable device there. And then the various features that are on this device. In this case, you've got your, um, uh, from the sort of left, the button module, the, the input output buttons, uh, the Bluetooth and other communications, a language acquisition module, that's a particular feature to this device, which is used for, for audio purposes. Uh, motion sensors, obviously very important as, uh, as Leon described in his product. This one has a particular fingerprint or other biometric information module, um, audio output, a, a speaker. Um, and an input and output module, again, linked to the buttons. Um, so all of these features are, are typical ones that 
may be used on a product. And again, as you can see from this drawing, we're not limited to specific features here. We're trying to claim and describe these features as broadly as possible. And here is, I think it's from the same pattern actually, just this, this again just shows you've got the device here which is the bracelet sort of towards the left and then you've got the sort of the way that this is interacting by some sort of language command to a smart audio system and then how a, an external system compare with the compare with the bracelet to receive signals and, and information from it here to show um, how, how broad we can get away with in a patent is, is, a, is a typical sort of patent claim, as it were, if you know anything about patents. A patent has, has three main um, sections in it. The first section is a fairly specific description of the specific and, and general ways that you might um, make a product uh, together with expansion drawings for that and then the important part of a patent is the claims at the end which define as broadly as we can the overall concept behind it and these are the parts that are the important parts of a patent because in order to infringe a patent you have to be doing something that's within a claim so for this one for example it, it's a very broad broad claim um, a security device a wearable device storing personal inf information identification data which can communicate with or be interrogated by any external device to reveal the data um, and including sensor means again we haven't described what sort of sensor means they are nice and broadly for detecting continued contact with a wearer a means for indicating that contact is or has been broken so this is essentially a device that is worn it may be a bracelet or a watch or something um, and basically it has a means for checking that it's always on the body of a person and hasn't been taken off. Um, and it can obviously be used for obtaining access to a particular machine. If you're working at a, at a workstation, you may want to make sure the person working there is actually there, hasn't just taken their bracelet off and then gone off to have a cup of coffee. Um, so again, we have a nice broad, broad claim there to cover many different versions and then we would go down in the claims to more specific versions um, so here we, we say the type of the type of um, functionality that the sensor might have so it might detect actual physical contact between a bracelet and the skin of a wearer electrical properties of the skin thermal properties uh, it may have heart rate monitoring obviously uh, unless someone's dead they they're going to have a to have a pulse and nerve impulses um, and then this shows a, a further claim in this in this patent um, which is again the functionality of it this describes how it also may have a functionality of identifying that a user is authorized this is because of the personal identification data is authorized for a particular task or is actually authorized to use a particular workstation so you've got from this proof that uh, the bracelet is being worn by a person who is at that machine and is authorized to use that machine. This is from another typical wearable patent application. Um, and this is a claim to basically an, an electrical part of the electrical system of it. So in this, we've got uh, comprising basically the processor, the battery, the sensor, memory, and so on. Um, and it has a particular configuration of the switches. Um, so again, this is purely an electrical feature of a device um, and is, is, is claiming that specific feature. And then we could go on to another claim, which would be in this, which would be for the same device and may even be for a separate patent. But in this case, we're talking about the mechanical design of the device. In here, we're not, even, we're not interested in particularly the functionality of it. It's the mechanical design of it. So we've got a housing for a battery, the air, an air vent, and this air permeable material, but water impermeable. Um, which basically allows airflow but not water flow and so here on the same device we're claiming first of all the electrical arrangement 
And secondly, the uh, the mechanical arrangement, just to show that on any device, there are maybe lots of different features that we can we can claim in a patent. This is actually a drawing from uh, the same patent as referred to in the last two slides. Um, this again showing the mechanical features here that it's made in separate modules which can be affixed together. And then also in the same patent here, we've got some um, uh, an electronic uh, electronic diagram just showing some of the electronic features that we may want to patent um, later on. It's patent, excuse me a second. This is this is actually from a from a design from Apple that I just found yesterday. Um, it's again showing how this is this is a patent. It might actually be a, a U.S. design patent, I believe, but where they're trying to claim the specific shape of the bracelet um, of a of a watch or other or other device, um, just to show that the the range of things that you can protect on a on a wearable device and its system. This is one that, um, yeah, this is for a particular product. Um, you can see that there's a substrate shown with a, an active tag on it. There's various fluid units on it, 112 and 111, and electrodes on this substrate and a temperature sensor. So these are components that will be on a wearable device. Um, now, I don't know if you, any of you from this can, can guess what sort of device this may be, this may be but if we go on to the next slide here you can see that it's it's an extremely inv important invention that i'm 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 rather um glad has been invented now and it's quite surprising it wasn't invented before essentially it's it's an appy or a diaper which can detect when the the baby or indeed a, a, an adult has um has done has answered the call of nature and has therefore and therefore uh, sends a signal which enable which enables a text message to be sent to to a parent or carer um so yeah a really important um, invention that i'm s sad that when i'm in my baby when i had a very young baby this wasn't available it would have saved an awful lot of um hassle as it were Uh, this is an electronic, well, a, a, a diagram of electronics from this from this patent, actually showing if you can see there the, the various um, fluid devices and the electronics. It shows this in a little more detail. These are all parts that will be in the actual the wearable device, the nappy itself, um, causing a signal to be sent to to the user or a text message or WhatsApp message or whatever. This is actually the, the the claim that was in this patent, or one of the main claims. And here we're claiming again, um, fairly broadly, the idea of uh, a, div a device which detects. Here you go. If you pardon the um, slightly crude language, I hope none of you are having breakfast at the moment. Uh, detecting excretion of bodily waste from a body, and it has these liquid units. Uh, it has a power supply unit. It then has this notification unit. The language here is slightly torturous, but it was from an original Japanese language. Um, a notification unit, which then notifies an outside person that an action has occurred. And then this then talks about where the electrodes and the, um, the neutralizer retention unit are provided. So again, this shows the sort of broad range of, of products and features that can be covered by by patents. Um, this did lead to uh, a granted patent. So turning a little more specifically to patents now, I talked earlier about how some there are some exclusions to what can be patented. And in Europe and the UK, the law says you can't patent computer software.
But it then goes on to say, insofar as the invention solely relates to software per se. In fact, computer software is patentable and very often is. A lot of my work is done on computer software. And for computer software, you have the same considerations as before a product has to be new it has to be not obvious it also has to have um, what the European Patent Office would call special technical features or a technical effect which means that at the point of novelty what you do is you look at what the invention is and you say what is different about this invention what are the actual novel features of this over what's gone before and you say are these technical features um, so, for example, software that is obviously controlling machinery, software that's controlling electric vehicles, for example, software that's um, image processing in a different way, processing sound, um, general operating systems for, for computers or whatever, which may be manipulating or processing data in a, in a clever way, a more efficient way, maybe storing data in a more efficient way in memory, maybe compressing data, um, encryption techniques and so on, as I mentioned. All of these can, can be protected and in your wearable devices, this can be quite important. Um, but systems like I don't know, just game game software that uses standard functionality, software that essentially reproduces what a human being could do, albeit taking decades to do, without any sort of extra special technical input, generally wouldn't be patentable. But most software, or a lot of software, particularly in, in the fields of that I think most of you will be involved in. Most software would be protectable. Um, I touched on apps earlier. Usually the apps themselves aren't protectable, but again, if they have specific technical features, for example, if you have an app that is interfacing with a, with a mobile device's camera, microphone, sound system in a particular clever way, that might be protectable. Or if it's communicating with the device itself or with the outside world in a, in a unique and clever way, that also might be protectable. And well, business methods themselves, ones that use software, again, the same considerations apply. A business method that is simply deciding when and where to, to trade, um, whether it's money or goods, depending on pricing or supply or whatever, generally wouldn't be protectable. But again, if they're using some very clever technical methods at the sort of point of novelty, at the point where they're different from other systems they may be protectable to go back to to apps as i was saying um improved processing generally would be might would be protectable as would novel communication methods um but one thing that that you can do for for apps in particular is to think about trademark protection both for the name of the app and indeed for the general service and product you're you're providing itself and for the icon itself you can protect the icon as a as a trademark that can be quite useful to protect the use of this icon so just to move on to talk about trademarks and, and other types of intellectual property. First of all, we have trademarks, um, which are often, uh, people often don't think of trademarks in, in, I've put here that trademarks might be your most valuable asset. Uh, the name of your company, once you're, once you're out there in the market, you're selling goods and services and people trust and admire your goods and services. Um, the name of your company and its trademarks can be a, a, an enormously vital trademark, uh, vital asset, and that should not be, be under, under, under um, considered. Um, and you, you should always consider what we would do if, particularly for a smaller business, but also for a larger business as well, if someone were to set up round the corner from you selling a similar product or service under a similar name to you, what would be perhaps probably would be with, with worse quality products or service than you? What would you think if, if, a, um, if someone were to, to inadvertently buy or look at those products and then think, they could be associated with you or indeed would buy those products instead of yours. So the trademark represents the goodwill in your business. Um, 
and has been described before as the attractive force which brings in business, which is quite a nice term, I think. And a trademark can be any sign which can be represented graphically and can distinguish your goods. So it can be um, many different types of things. Um, a trademark can actually last as a registered trademark forever. Uh, once, once it's registered as a registered trademark, you have to renew it, pay a fee every year to keep it going. But in fact, um, here is the first UK registered trademark, um, obviously the Bass Triangle device, which is still, I believe, being being renewed and still enforced today. And that's from, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact day, but 18 something. So in terms of trademarks, you can register many different types of trademarks. You can register words, uh, designs, logos, names, numbers, um, uh, boots number seven, for example, uh, letters. You can also register things like smells. If you have a particular smell, obviously of a of a fragrance or a perfume, but there are also other smells. If you if there is a particular smell associated with a product, and um, oh, I guess a wearable device might be one that can emit a, a fragrance for some reason, and the actual smell of that, as long as it can be set out graphically or set out in some way that you can understand it. It might even be there is a registered trademark for the smell of roses on car tires. Um, so it's, it's pretty broad, the kind of things that you can register. Uh, the shape of packaging and the shape of product itself, you can register as a trademark. So the Coca-Cola bottle, for example, um, as long as it, it's one that's used that doesn't have solely a technical effect, the packaging. It's used as a, in a trademark sense. Uh, advertising jingles, for example. Um, colors, you can register colors. So, so um, orange, the color of, you know, the orange color associated with orange. Other colors that are strongly associated with, with, um, with companies and their products. Uh, you can register sounds. Jingles, as I said above, but other sound you can register, or the um, you know the, the old Intel inside little little ditty that would be registered as a trademark, and slogans as again um, a Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play. That kind of thing can be registered as as a as a trademark. So trademarks are something that you should you should consider. They're they're relatively cheap. It's fairly simple to acquire and it's well worth protecting your trademark. And also when you're launching a new product, making sure that you've uh, checked out whether the wonderful new trademark you want to um, use on your new products or service is actually available and isn't used by someone else. So it's always worthwhile doing a quick check on other trademarks when you're going to launch a new product or service. Um, one other useful feature of the patent of the patent system is uh, the patent box that I'm sure many of you will be aware of. This is a, a tax advantage, which means that if you have a UK patent, I call a qualifying patent here, which is a UK patent, a European patent, or a patent in certain other countries, you benefit from only paying a very low UK corporation tax on products incorporating that patent. And the actual amount you pay is only 10% rate, which is basically as kind of a 50% cut in the, the corporation tax you'd pay. Um, the scheme has been in force for several years now and uh, is, it's probably under underutilized, but it's certainly something that you should consider um, when 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 launching a new product, or indeed if you have a patent on an existing product, see if you can use patent box advantages on that. So contact your your accountant um, or whatever, and see if you can actually use that to your to your advantage. And one also useful aspect of the patent box is that it applies to a sale of a whole product incorporating a patented item, um, even if the patented item is just a small part thereof. So if you've got um, a device, um, a wearable device or whatever, or, or a larger scale device, and there is a, a particular nut or fastener or button mechanism that is, is the actual patented bit, even though that might only represent a relatively small part of the, the cost price of that, of that 
item, you're entitled to claim for patent box relief on sales of that whole item. Um, there is admittedly a, a, a relatively complex calculation that your accountant has to do, and they have to take off things like marketing costs and other things, but it is still a, a major advantage to use the patent box system. Um, another advantage of, of the patent box system is that if you wish to use the, the patent system cleverly, you can apply for a patent simply for patent box purposes, which is very, very specific because all you're trying to do is cover the product you are making. So in that case, we may not want to try to draft claims, draft the patent as broadly as we possibly can. We might want to go in with only a very, very specific patent directed solely at your other specific product, which means we can, it's cheaper to draft and file the patent and, and to get the patent granted. And also it can be granted much quicker than normally, because if we have a very specific narrow product, which feature we're trying to claim and patent, we can hope there will be much less um, prior art, as we'd say, other products out there that the patent office, when they do their searches and examination, would find um, to say, well, it's a bit similar to this, so you need to narrow down. If we already started started with a very narrow concept, we can get a patent granted quicker. Uh, normally, a patent to get a patent granted would take several years from the date you apply. The important date is the date you apply for a patent after, and you can tell the world about your idea, start to sell it. But for a patent box patent, um, if we go in quite narrowly, use all the acceleration techniques available, we can get a patent granted within less than a year. And you can then use that for patent box purposes. We can also, what we often do is to apply for a patent with some claims very specific for patent box purposes. And then a few um, statements to much broader concepts so we can then get the patent box patent granted quickly and then divide out and apply in other countries um, in Europe and also in the UK as a as divided out patent for the main concept. So we've got the patent box patent so it's working to get you the tax advantage and we're also getting the broader claim hopefully granted to cover against people using your same general concept. So don't underestimate the patent box. Um, briefly on other types of intellectual property. Copyright exists on everything you, you draw, write, basically everything you make, you have copyright right on. Um, you don't have to do anything to enforce that copyright. You just need to make sure that you have proof that you came up with the idea, um, dated proof. Um, copyright uh, exists both on, on, if you've got a, some literature, both on the words that literature and on the layout itself. So for example, Shakespeare plays, anyone can perform a Shakespeare play without needing a license. But if I was to actually write down the uh, script of a Shakespeare play and, and sell that, you wouldn't be able to copy that, that specific layout of it. Um, lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. There's some types of copyright that last a bit longer, but a bit shorter, but uh, in general, that's that's the lifetime of copyright. Um, unregistered design right is essentially copyright in three dimensional articles, which does have a relatively short lifetime, 10 years in the UK. And you also need to prove if someone was to copy the shape of your design, you need to prove they've copied it. Whereas the advantage of applying for a registered design is that you don't need to prove that someone has copied you. You can, uh, you can register the shape of a design, provided it has some degree of eye appeal, which can be quite low. So most products can be made the subject to a registered design, which you can apply for in any country. It's simple and cheap, um, can last for up to 25 years, and can also protect parts of a design. So if you have a design and only a little part of it, it might be the handle of a mug or the, the face or display on a, on a, on a device. Um, you can then register that as a design. And you can register things like screenshots, uh, displays, as well as the hardware. As I said, partial designs as registered designs. Here's a typical registered design. Again, I think this is also an Apple product, just the shape of a watch. Um, and thank you. That's obviously a brief sort of introduction to intellectual property and patents uh, in this field and, and elsewhere. So um, hopefully you have some questions and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Very, very comprehensive there. Um, really, really good. Um, 
you know, as per usual, anybody, if uh, if you do have any questions, either, you know, please raise your hand or, uh, and we actually have a raised hand, so I'll, I'll go to that in a moment. Um, but obviously do please also put your questions in the in the, in the Q, uh, Q and A um, section so we, we can address them. Um, but Colin, we'll come to you now and I'll uh, I'll hand you the mic. Um, so hopefully Colin will join us on stage. There he is. <laughs> um, obviously I come from an engineering background, so rather than from the sales and marketing or the sort of the director level approach. Yep. Um, one of the issues I often have when speaking to engineers who are intimately familiar with the technology is it's difficult sometimes to see how something can be patentable. We think it's obvious because we're engineers working all the time. I'm sure. just wondering what the best way is sometimes to get engineers to be more eager to apply for patents or to explain how something that we see is just taking building blocks of things that already exist can result in being able to get a patent. It's that sort of reluctance that's quite difficult in, in engineers to overcome. Yeah, no, no I, no, I understand that reluctance totally, and it's something that we come across all the time. I mean, from a, from a sort of commercial point of view, obviously it's getting a patent is the only real way to stop someone else from, from nicking the concepts behind your products. Yeah, that's the most important thing behind it. Um, you can have confidentiality to a certain extent. You can try to keep products secret, trade secrets, which works in some fields. It, you know, it can work where you've got a, um, a circuit design that's hidden in something um, or in a, a piece of software that's hidden in something. But for most products that are out there, as soon as they're in the market, it's evident how they work. So a patent, as I said, is really the only way to, to actually protect against people nicking your general concept. In terms of, yeah, the, this, this idea that, oh, well, we don't think we've come up with anything clever anyway. Um, as I said, the test of sort of inventive step or obviousness is to look at a person who is considered to know everything there is to that field but really is is a bit maybe not dim but who has no creative instinct at all and to really sort of separate yourself from from and to, to look at look at to look from outside and to think what, why have I come up with this idea? You know, was it obvious to me? What did I have to do? What was the creative process? What was the um, what was the problem? And what have I solved with that? And the European Patent Office is very keen on the um, so-called rather than just, for example, let's say the building blocks are yep. known to people skilled in the art. So sure. the building yep. blocks themselves yep. are special, but as long as the application and end use and there's solution to a problem is unique that is still good grounds to apply yeah absolutely i mean but many many patents many really useful patents come from using standard building blocks standard components it's the way they're put together um obviously if they're put together in a very obvious way that the classic example is you know a sausage machine where you've got a, a mincing part you've got a skin part you've got a part that puts the mince in the in the skin each of those components in themselves are known and there's nothing clever about combining them but if you're putting together existing building blocks in a in a clever way particularly if you're using them in a in a new way if you're using something that was used in one particular technology or for one particular type of product and you're using it in a whole different technology or maybe using it for a slightly different purpose that can certainly be be protectable Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, great stuff. Um, I'm actually conscious of uh, of time, so um, well, actually, what I'm going to do, um, John, I'm going to ask you one very, very question, a very quick question. Okay. So, as a business owner, <laughs> I am not really that interested in admin and paperwork, but I am interested in making money. So, mm -hmm. isn't, it, isn't it just easier to not bother? And just keep things secret and not go through the expense and hassle of doing you know registering for patents in the first place and stuff what, what, what? um no because you, you're interested in the, in the in in making money um in order for that you want to sell as many of your products and your services as you want and if you don't apply for if you can't can get a patent and don't apply for a patent you're opening the field to anyone else to, to come in and, and make a similar product or a similar service, maybe a cheaper, shoddier product at a cheaper at a cheaper um, price. Um, 
so you, you really are holding yourself open there and also it shouldn't uh, there is also this sort of misconception that it's it's an awful lot of work and hassle to get a patent yes it's not a particularly cheap cheap thing to do as is no as is any legal protection or indeed insurance it's often useful to think of a patent as, a, as an insurance um but uh, a, a good patent attorney should be able to have an initial meeting with you work find a get what he needs from you and then just go away draft the patent take most of the responsibility off of you do all the hard work when any sort of issues come back from patent offices with reports and things the patent attorney can look at that can advise you can really help you and hold you by the hand and guide you through that so they're doing most of the work so, so this idea that it's it's an awful lot of hassle really shouldn't be there yeah, no, very, very true. And, and I know that you and I have spoken about this a lot. And, and I think one of the things that a lot of people overlook as well is, is the, the value that it will add to your company. Um, you know, people may have heard in the news um, not that long ago that one of our member companies was acquired by um, a larger company. And um, a very large part of the evaluation and why the company was interested in the first place was the huge number of patents um, that they, they registered. So um you know this misconception that you know patents are a hassle and don't end value and they don't do anything for your business is actually quite the opposite right yeah ab absolutely absolutely yes there's there are many examples where where the the ip portfolio the patents are are by far the most important aspect in, in valuing a, a sale or a company yeah so if you're interested in making money you should address embrace patents that's that's the message here isn't it really absolutely so, always yeah. always the first thing you should think of is patents you may not be able to get one um a patent advice attorney may say no it's not worth applying but always think about it whenever you come up with something and get your engineers and your and indeed your sales team to think of that before before too long <laughs> perfect excellent stuff thank you very thank much John. that was very comprehensive um thank you very much for for joining us really really good stuff and, uh, and we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Um, right. So we'll move on to the um, the final speaker of the day, um, which is uh, Paul Brook. Um, so I'm just inviting him onto the stage. Um, now this should really be quite interesting. Where um, it's it's really about sort of uh, e textiles and uh, and electronics within within textiles itself, which uh, which is is quite a fascinating area. So. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say anything else because I'll just do it in injustice and, and instead we'll hand over to, to Paul. So, uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Pim. Um, yeah, appreciate those um, um, uh, you know, the um, in introduction there. Um, my name is Paul Brook and the company is Conductive Transfers. Um, I'm co-director co and founder of the conductive transfer process uh, which was um, uh, developed quite a few years ago now uh, on the back of our history with uh, manufacturing heat transfers uh, we were screen printers by trade and uh, we developed the the, the process uh, on, on a chance meeting with a, a guy who, who was a, a conductive guru and uh, at the time he came along and he saw what we were doing with the heat transfers and he, he thought, you know, that there's something in this to actually bring together electronics and textiles and create functional textiles. And at first we thought it was mad as a box of frogs, to be honest with you. We thought, you know, this guy, what, what's he talking about? Putting uh, circuitry into textiles. And uh, it went from there. We've been on a you know a long a long journey to, to where we are uh, today. So uh, I'll show you the presentation. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, so with with uh, e textiles in in general, um, over over the years there has been problems for, for companies to take their ideas and and concepts and make them a reality. You know, bring them to become commercial products. Um, with with what we've actually created as a as a product, we've it's a process, and we're not in the area of, of actually creating 
uh, products, but actually the the process of being able to put a, a circuit into onto textiles. Currently, uh, there's different methods of achieving this with conductive yarns and conductive em embroidery. Um, they can be quite expensive uh, to produce and you know take time to manufacture, but the, there is added benefits with using conductive yarns that um, you know for products such as heating applications and uh, resistive and capacitive sensors uh, for, for strain um, for creating electrodes for body function uh, measurement and um, printed TPU or thermoplastic polyurethane um, is uh, another method but it can be very uncomfortable to, to the wearer um, so by printing on these particular films and then uh, applying them to, to fabrics, you know, they're not uh, that, that great for, um, you know, for the wearer, but they, they can help by strengthening the actual e-textile, you know, for, for, the, for the production or making them a, a stronger. Um, printed textiles, now printing directly onto the fabric the, the ink generally goes into the gaps in the material, so it's going into the undulations of the fabric and can you know, co cost quite a lot more money because you're having to print various layers, layer at a time on top of the material and building those up. And uh, then there can be issues with uh, stretchability. So as a business, you know, we, we created um, a transfer, which is, uh, as I say, it's a conductive transfer. So if you can see that, um, so what we're doing is we're screen printing a series of layers onto a polyester film. Uh, and um, it, we're printing one layer at a time using the screen print process. Um, and, um, and then ultimately we end up with the, with the actual uh, transfer. So yeah, the conductive transfer solution that we came up with um, was to bring together electronics and textiles and create functional uh, transfers. And um, what we do is, I say, we, we print, screen print a series of layers, one layer at a time, onto the polyester film. We have an encapsulation layer and then a conductive layer that can be uh, silver or potentially copper, nickel, uh, graphene, and even, even carbon. And we print it, so we screen print the first layer onto the film and we cure it down our oven, uh, bring that back, screen print the next layer, and so forth. So it's a bit like a cheese sandwich. You have um, insulation layer, conductive layer, insulation layer, and then finally an adhesive layer. So once the, the transfer is actually printed, we flip that over and then heat press it onto uh, material, onto fabric, and peel the transfer away. Similar to the transfers that you find in sportswear for the numbers on the back of the shirts and the, the sponsorship on the front. So the, the transfer is peeled away and you're left with uh, the, the transfer actually sitting on, on the surface of the material. So unlike the, the screen printing method, the, the transfer method enables the, it to sit on the surface so as the, the transfer, as the conduct transfer stretches uh, in line with the, with the fabric. So the resistance increases, uh, but it then reduces back down to its, its starting point. Uh, but it opens up to literally thousands of applications. As I said, we're, uh, not you know from an electronics background with screen printers by trade so we're bringing together you know uh, the ideas and concepts from different companies that are, are creating these fantastic products and they're coming to us with their technology and looking for us to replicate their idea uh, onto as a transfer and apply it onto their material so that they can create these uh, functional products. Um, this, this is a, uh, for the last few years now, we've been 
manufacturing for one of our lead clients. It's a product called Innovo, and it's for people that suffer from uranium incontinence. Um, and the, the product is a, a bear, basically a pair of shorts. So we're printing the circuits, and then the ships overseas and heat applied onto the shorts, and it provides muscle stimulation uh, for the pelvic floor area of, of the body uh, to help uh, people that suffer from the urinary incontinence. Uh, so it's an actual medical product. Now, uh, the great thing is that this, this particular client has got FDA approval, so they're selling it into the US as well as across Europe and uh, other parts of the world. Um, We've already produced now beyond the 40,000 uh, units. We're already 70, 80,000 uh, units that we've actually produced on the, the specific product. So it shows that uh, we've been able to take our process and, uh, you know, for it to be, uh, you know, ma manufactured. Okay, so um, the the, the family of um, uh, products that we we've actually developed within this uh, within the circuits, um, as well as the uh, the printed tracks and the electrodes, which we call elastotrode, uh, we've developed a printed heater, uh, which we call elastotherm. The the heater can be used for in medical for people that suffer from uh, back pain uh, to heated seats in. Uh, cars uh, to any, any heated area of the, the, the car, basically. But you know, many many different applications, including industrial workwear. Uh, but the the heater predominantly can get up to temperature in just a matter of seconds, three or four seconds. It, it's really quick, and it, everything is just ink. So all, all we're doing is printing the, the the layer one layer at a time, but different types of ink to give us the the, the end product. With the heater, we use um, uh, a particular ink called a, a PTC, it's a positive temperature coefficient ink that basically ensures that the, uh, the heater doesn't, um, you know, uh, ramp up too much and uh, uh, catch fire. It's, um, it's, it's an added protection for, um, for, for the product by, it regulates to ensure that the temperature is uh, controlled at a, a set amount. Uh, but yeah, we're very exciting with the ETA. We're doing uh, a lot of work with a lot of companies in uh, um, industrial work with automotive and, uh, and medical with, uh, with our ETA technology. Uh, hybrid jet electronics is um, uh, something we've been working on uh, for a while and a lot of it's in the R&D uh, phase and it's basically bringing, bringing together uh, sensors and components and being able to implement them into our, our circuits. Uh, later I'll, I'll show you a video and you'll see at the back end of the, the video uh, where we, we've actually um, incorporated through pick and place equipment the, the actual components into, into our circuit. So yeah again similar loads and loads of different applications with this. Um, so I say embedding uh, core body temperature sensors, for example, into um, uh, clothing NFC uh, chips. We've done a bit of work on that RFIDs, uh, not just the LEDs that you, you'll see in the, the video footage. Um, yeah, similarly, capacitive touch, um, you know, loads of different types of uh, sensors. We've done this on to loads of different types of material from uh, leather to you know non-wovens, all sorts of different materials, and um, the, with the uh, prints being so lightweight and very thin, you know you don't even recognise that that they're there. Uh, the Elastolink is we've in, we introduced this this form of uh, technology for people that um, looking to go over over seams. Um, so sometimes it can be down to the actual garment, uh, how that is actually made, you know, the, the structure of the, the, the garment, you know, the, the panels that are put together to create the seams, you know, this can be sometimes achieved using uh, tapes um, or having um, a, a tubular type uh, garment. 
but if that's not the case, then we, we can uh, utilise a method of seam crossing and able to take our circuits over the seam and around the back of the garment, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, this technology is just not not for textiles as such. It, you know, it can be applied into footwear, into onto socks uh, for you know checking you know things such as vital signs uh, of uh, people. But yeah, uh, covering a lot of different areas, a lot of different uh, you know technologies, and um, you know with, with our uh, with our uh, transfers. So yeah, we, we've, we have granted patents and patents pending uh, across these different sectors. So um, it's, it's enabled, it's been very important for us that the patents, you know, we're, you know, we're uh, at the moment, we're ensuring that we're uh, following through and, you know, policing to, to ensure that uh, other, other companies that, you know, that are getting in touch with us to uh, use our technology that it gives them the peace of mind that we're, we're on the ball and that we're ensuring that uh, we're, the, we're the go to company for people that are looking to take their technologies and implement them into, uh, into the textile. Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, I talked about automotive, medical, that there's loads of different industries that uh, are adapting our, our technology within our products. Um, you know, certainly on the medical side, that's one of our key areas, you know, particularly with the ECG and, you know, the muscle simulation that I mentioned about. Um, but also, you know, pressure sensors, for example, uh, determining the pressure sores in hospital beds uh, to you know, assess sensors in, in footwear, even uh, caps, you know, for people that uh, suffer from epilepsy and uh, sleep apnea as well have been adopted by some of, the, some of our, our clients. So yeah, many, many applications, it, it's, it's down to the, your imagination as to what, you know, what it can be used for. Um, as I said, we are not developing the products, that's down to the, the client and uh, the innovators and the inventors. We're, we're the guys that are helping them get there with, with our process of being able to uh, take their ideas and put them into the, the textile. So yeah, similarly automotive, I mentioned about the heaters, it's not just potentially on the car seats, but um, putting um, electrics into the linings of the cars and into the roof linings um, you know many 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 different applications within that that field uh, industrial workwear sportswear uh, being able to uh, you know see with athletes you know their performance and how are there uh, you know how it can be improved by in including uh, certain uh, circuits and, and, and certain sensors that will help uh, improve our, our, the, how they operate. So yeah, I touched on about the, the, the benefits previously. Soft feel is, is very important because last thing you, you want is to, to uh, be wearing a, a wearable product and it's very uncomfortable. Um, lightweight, um, you know, I'll give you an example, you know, with our heaters, our heaters only weigh around about 13 grams and for example, uh, heaters in, in a typical car seat can be anything up to around about two kilos. So um, certainly the, the benefits for, for automotive for fuel consumption and performance and uh, ramping up with the uh, temperature, you know, in just, you know, literally three or four seconds, it, they're all, all benefits. Uh, yeah, very, very uh, thin uh, circuits. Um, as I was showing before, you know, the, the transfer itself, you know, if I peel away the actual transfer from, from the sheet before it's applied, it's very, very thin and, um, and it can seem, you know, potentially it can, can break. But once it's actually applied to the, uh, the uh, material, the substrate becomes very strong and you know a, a powerful uh, circuit. Um, yeah, we were able to achieve with the the ink chemistry 100% stretch. So as I mentioned before, silver, uh, particularly silver that we print, we've got excellent stretchability. 
some of the other inks like copper, not so much, but uh, but yeah, having that stretch, you know, in line with the other layers that, that we print and the fabric uh, give, gives us stretchable, you know, stretchable electronics. Um, yeah, supply chain. Now, this is this is vital for a, a lot of companies that are looking to adopt our technology. They they're able to uh, have uh, the transfers manufacturing in one location and ship to another uh, area of the of the world, so that they don't have to be applied in the same uh, same area that it's manufactured. So we could, for example, manufacture our facility in in Barnsley and ship to uh, to the US for example for application where where the material is and that makes perfect sense and and that helps the innovators by it, it protects their IP by by doing that so it's not being um, made at, at the source where their, their product is being applied it's uh, it's it's being made uh, the, the transfers that are being made prior prior to that um, so yeah, cost effectiveness as well with, with the, the method we've adopted and, and the sheet size uh, that we print. So we screen print on a uh, sheet fed uh, print machines. Um, there's other methods such as roll to roll, for example, uh, but you're limited to the, the width that can be actually produced. So we could potentially uh, print up to around about 90 by uh, 62 centimeters area and um, it, it becomes a very cost effective uh, process um, so uh, within uh, just a few hours we can have uh, created full fully functioning uh, electrodes or circuits wherever the, the customer uh, requires um, yeah depending on the design we can make it breathable so we can uh, the design can be created so that the, the area of the circuits uh, are open in certain parts so that uh, you know you still got the breathability with the, the materials mentioned about the seam crossing uh yeah the ce fda approvals um you know it's, it's very important um you know this this is generally achieved by the, the looking at the ink chemistry and making sure that you know it passes certain regulations in all regards um toxicity and you know ensuring that the uh, the product is biocompatible and um, you know a lot of this is done by our, our customers but we we guide them along the way as to where they, they want to go with that uh, durability is an important factor as well for, for some products not all products but some products um like for example i mean the innova product that's uh, hand wash but the you know we're working towards high durability it's one of the, the key areas within our business that we're we're striving towards um, towards ideally 100 washes eventually uh, at 30 degrees, because you know with um, uh, e, e textiles, people ultimately want to be able to just put it into the washing machine with the, their other garments and no specific uh, washing techniques that you know people every day want them to adapt and adopt really. Um, so yeah, with the washability, it's uh, it's a key area, and we're working with uh, the ink manufacturers, and we have our own chemists as well working on the ink technology to make it make it more more durable as we go along. Um, yeah, so as a business, we we you know we offer prototypes through to production, so you know we can uh, create a prototypes within just a, a couple of weeks, really, and uh, and and. Um, you know go, go from there so yeah the the whole thing the whole area is very innovative you know we're, we're learning as we're going all along and uh, certainly new products that the customers are uh, 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 coming to us and uh, looking to ad adopting their products it, it's it's very exciting um yeah i mean i'm talking about comp competition but i, I don't want this to sound like a sales pitch but it's looking at how you know that the current techniques of putting circuits onto textiles and how that compares with what what we have and uh, you know we, we come out really really strong with uh, what we've what we've created there's, there's a, a a lot to, a lot of work to, to do to uh, uh, for a lot of other applications and uh, we're evolving all the time with what what we've uh, created
So as our business, you know, the, the, the actual company was formed in 2017, but the, the concept of the, the process was uh, developed a few years before that. Um, you know, we provide a private owned uh, company. We, uh, we had uh, in the early days um, some investment through, um, uh, through in individuals that uh, came in and uh, uh, helped us uh, along the way. Uh, but yeah, 11,000 square feet, 1,100 meter squared uh, uh, unit. So we're uh, adapting and adopting new equipment, new techniques to help us with the, the system. Um, 17 staff, you know, all talented in all sorts of different ways. You know, many with, as I say, from screen printing background, you know, been involved in screen printing for 40 years, some of them. And uh, yeah, we're uh, very, you know, they've got, got some very talented uh, guys. Um, patterns, you know, with uh, what John was talking about, you know, patterns, uh, you know, for our business and uh, are really been really important, you know, to uh, help, uh, you, you know, give certainly our customers that peace of mind uh, of what they're taking on and incorporating our, our system in their, their products. So, yeah, it's had a, a big, big part to play in, in, the, in the business. Um, so yeah, in terms of IP, so we 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 will as a a company will come and will approach us. You know, we'll share a mutual NDA with the company, and then they'll provide us a, their design, and uh, we evaluate that, and then create a, a, a prototype from that. And um, you know, and that can be just a matter of two or three weeks, really, from from me first meeting that company to created a, a prototype with the, with the circuits. So it's very quick because, you know, the, the printed, printed process, as I say, printing the, the various layers, we just uh, change the, the, the technique to suit the individual customer. So if they're wanting a particular resistance, so we can affect that by, you know, giving a, a, a different uh, build of uh, track, you know, the conductive track, uh, the thickness of the track, uh, to the, um, you know, whether it be sinusoidal waves to help with the stretch, you know, we can do a lot of different things. And uh, so the ne next level is to go into manufacture. So we can produce here in Barnsley, you know, in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of units. Um, but ultimately, you know, we we're wanting to uh, provide a technology transfer so that companies can adopt the technology themselves. So whether it be um, for our customer then to pass it on to their partner for for manufacture or, or for them to do it in-house themselves, ultimately can do that. As I said, because of these thousands of different applications, uh, unfortunately we can't, we can't do it all in-house. Uh, we can do so much, but we can concentrate on the R&D and, and developing the, the, the chemistry and developing the, the pro process yet further uh, and uh, by um, uh, companies taking on the, the licensing and for uh, CT conduct transfers to, to receive a, a, a license fee and uh, royalties from, uh, from, from the product is where you know where we're aiming for but we can help that each each company that takes this on by providing uh, the equipment or, you know, guiding them along with the, the right equipment that's needed, but importantly, the training both here in the UK and, and overseas, you know, with this experience from uh, print consultancy that we've done many years uh, prior to this, we, we can uh, help companies evolve and, uh, you know, uh, produce their own conductive uh, circuits and uh, with the ink manufacturers and uh, from the, the inks that we've developed with them and our, our using our own chemists, we can provide the, the materials that they the need. So we can help companies every step of the way uh, to help them adopt the, the technology into their, into their product. Um, so yeah, as I said, we, we're ISO accredited and uh, you know meeting a, a lot of the, the needs of, of, of the industry and uh, uh, following what, what, what they require. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to now now show uh, an actual uh, video. Uh, stop sharing for a second on that, and 
yeah, this this video um, is what we've created. It will give you an overview of of the process through the business, and uh, you know, show from um, from uh, artwork right through until uh, production. Uh, you know, producing the actual circuits and testing them and the different products that can actually be uh, created from from that. So uh, I'll show you the, the video now.
Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that just gives you a bit of a, an insight as to how how we produce the, the, the transfers. And um, yeah, if, if anyone's got any um, questions, I'd be happy to uh, happy to answer them. Thank you. Right, so apologies, people. I oh, yeah, right. my, my camera wasn't working for whatever reason. Well, I was doing something wrong there, Pim, for a minute. No, no, I, I don't know what happened. I was I was pressing things frantically, so I do apologize. Um, sorry. Um, fascinating presentation, Paul. Thank you very much. That's what I started to say, and then I realized that I didn't have any <laughs> any screen. So apologies for that. But really, really interesting stuff. Um, really good. One of the things that that really surprised me, and and hopefully you can comment on this a little bit. I mean, given how thin and light it is, how does it not damage very easily? It that that seems like a, a pretty unbelievable aspect of it. Yeah, no, that, that yeah, that that's it. You know, because we, we're printing thin layers of, of ink. I mean, ultimately, the the actual thickness of the the transfer can range anything from around about eighty microns to maybe around about one hundred and sixty microns thick. So even then, you know, it's sometimes as you know, thin as a thin as a hair, but once it's actually applied, the adhesive, the last layer of adhesive that we uh, print onto the, the the circuit, once that's heat pressed onto the material, it bonds to the fabric and becomes it strengthens and it becomes solid. So each and every layer is compatible with each other, and it all uh, bonds together. And then the very last layer is what bonds the whole thing to the material. So then it becomes a very uh, strong strong product but uh, yeah in, in its uh, initial state yeah you can you can easily tear the circuit uh, on, on the film but th this is what makes it uh, great you know in, in terms of the the, the lightweight um, uh, you know what, what it is and, and you did kind of indicate that with, with different using with different materials or so silver you mentioned this is particularly good but different coppers you know probably make it a little bit more more difficult so presumably based on the applications that you want to use there's different routes to go down and different materials to use and uh, yeah that, that, that's it you know different different customers wanting uh, different uh, things from it you know might want a specific resistance you know might want a higher resistance for some some projects you know maybe utilize the carbon um some sometimes with the electrodes that we print we we print the silver and we can print a carbon over the top as a protective layer that can help with durability but and uh, it can also help with biocompatibility as well for touching next to the skin for certain applications. But yeah, copper, um, you know, copper is an interest to some companies, graphene, uh, with the properties of graphene. But yeah, the, you know, it opens itself to using different elements within the, uh, within the, 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 the track. So it's, it's basically building blocks. I mean, on some projects we can go as printing as many as 15 layers and others maybe only four layers um each each and every layer doing a different thing so uh, you know you can have many many uh, layers of uh, conductive you know you can have one layer you know uh, for passing a current and another layer for taking taking information from from the body Excellent. Uh, fascinating. I, I was actually going to ask you about graphene but um you've obviously covered it and, uh, and you clearly use it so um very very interesting um what are you uh, don't please don't uh, everybody don't let me ask all the questions please do put your questions in the q a session or indeed raise your hand if, if you have any as, as well um because uh, because i'll just take over so please don't let me so so um put things in there please um but um do, do you see other printing technologies being utilized um for, for for this in the future as well yeah no no definitely um so from from our process point of view, I mean, there's there's other technologies uh, people are looking at adopting, such as ink, inkjet, for example. Um, certainly, with that, with our process, because we're all about the about the transfer, because as I said, the transfer sits on the surface of the material, and it's not going the undulations of the fabric. Um, but with with inkjet, we can uh, eventually create a hybrid type technology. So uh, the um, the conductive element is printed using the uh, the inkjet and um you know by doing that you, you can get real fine uh, 
uh, fine detail. I mean, we get pretty pretty good uh, detail at the moment with uh, with our current uh, equipment that we uh, we have in house, and we were able to um, when when we print, we get uh, we have camera registration as well, so we can get accurate accurate layer on layer. But yeah, certainly, certainly wing jet is going to play a big part in the, in the future, and uh, um, you know as a you know, with our technology, we you know we will look at uh, adopting that. Um, roll to roll as well it is you know uh, as we, we know it's already used predominantly um, for, uh, for with with a lot of companies. But again, similar with our process, it can be uh, utilised to to create using roll to roll. But as I say, you limit it to the. The, the width that it can actually achieve, but uh, yeah, we're, we're always evolving and uh, you know showing that in the presentation, well, and certainly in the video uh, for the picking and placing, you know, certainly the um, uh, pointing components into the, the into the tracks is going to play a big part in our, our future. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and I was actually going to ask about that because how how do you connect them to the to the transfer? How does how does that work? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's Right. Yeah, it's it, it's basically it's a, from from creating the transfer. Then we have open points on the transfer where uh, conductive adhesive is applied within. Uh, so you have an open point where you've got part of the conductive area showing showing through the the conductive adhesive gets applied in that that specific point, and then the component or I'm sure there the LED is mounted on top of that. And then it's sealed with a, another adhesive, um, and then you know heat applied uh, over and, and go from there. So, uh, so uh, I think we saw a little bit, a uh, little sample of that in the, in the video with the little LEDs and the. That's it. Yeah, but, you know, we've done, we've done work with NFCs, RFIDs, and uh, and another uh, components of chips, you know, uh, as well. So it lends itself to you know many, many different uh, products. I mean, so, you know, some some areas, you know, like industrial where 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 where, you know, the you know as uh, Leon was showing, where you're working in different um, extremities, you know, it can be quite challenging. As to, so, certainly from an R and D point of view, it, it's an area that we're working to improve um, towards. So, um, it's, it's quite from from our point of view, quite a young concept, but. Uh, but yeah, we're um, you know we're excited where it where it's taking us with, with that. Fantastic! No, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, thank you very much for for sharing that story. Uh, really, really good. And it doesn't look like we've had any any questions come in, um, and I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I think we'll leave it there. I mean, obviously, um, you know, as I said before, we'll we'll share the details um, with everybody afterwards anyway. So if there's anybody who wants to follow up with Paul afterwards, you know, feel free to do that. I, I do understand that at some point. Um, you know, you might not want to talk about some of the, the future projects that you're you're into um, in an open forum. So, uh, so do please follow up with, with Paul separately. Uh, but for Paul, thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And um, I hope to see you again at a, at a future event. So, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, right. So that um, that just leads me to to wrap up um, the, the event uh, very quickly. Um, now, I did I did uh, realize that. Uh, I actually forgot to mention that um, we, we have champions for this uh, for this special interest group. So apologies for that. I should have done this uh, right at the at the introduction. But the way our special interest group works is that we we would have um, a, a group of champions who help us put together uh, the content for the event. You know, um, look at the themes, look at, at at what the event is 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 looking to do, um, and um, they they're also absolutely critical in helping us find us uh, speakers and things. So I just wanted to, to thank the champions for this group. So the, the champions for um, this group are um, Steve Borley from Decathlon, um, Colin Jackson from Partner Electronics that we we heard from a little bit earlier, uh, and obviously Phil, Phil Brady from PNB PNB Mobile uh, is one of the champions as well, and then finally Nick Fox Mail um, from Advancing Innovations um, are all the champions of this group. So thank you very much for your input, uh, gentlemen. It's it's uh, it's much appreciated. Obviously, thank you very much to all the speakers as well. Um, I thought they were fascinating insights, and I, I hope you that you've uh, enjoyed it. Um, it's been really, really interesting. Um, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to do as well is that obviously I'd like to point people um, towards both our website as well as our YouTube channel, uh, where not only we have all the, all the future events coming up um, for, for everybody. So have a look at our, at our website and obviously do sign up to anything that you're, you're interested in. And then obviously on our YouTube channel, we've got the, uh, the summary videos 
um, of a lot of our events, uh, and there's a lot of really um, fascinating stuff in there. So please do have a look at that as as well. Um, and then lastly, what I kind of wanted to do is um, as the SDC, together with our, our, our partner, Be the Business, we do actually offer uh, a program where you can get uh, uh, expert advice, and you get um, you get to work for twelve months with with an expert advisor. Um, from the likes of BAE Systems uh, or Siemens or Rolls Royce um, and other absolutely fantastic companies, and these are all senior people that will be able to advise you on your business and and provide you with effectively free um, consultancy. Um, so this is a program that's completely free of charge. It's uh, it's available to non-members as well as members of the SDC. Um, so if that's something that's that sparks your interest, uh, please have a look at the at the website under the growth tab where you will find it or of course, um, always get in, in touch with us. Um, but with that, I wanted to, to thank everybody. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna open up the social lounge again. So uh, do please jump onto a table and obviously connect with your, with your fellow attendees and, uh, and start conversations because um, at the end of the day, we are all about bringing people together. Um, so uh, please make use of that facility. So we'll leave the room open till uh, I would say about 12 o'clock or so. So um, yeah, please make use of that. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the event and uh, we we'll look forward to welcoming you at the next one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.